you very much. Thank you everyone for making it at 8 a.m. this morning. Um, so it's, it looks like a complicated title, but pretty much what we're going to be describing this morning is how can we start to look at phase velocity estimates and viscous media and attenuation parameters if we start to look at more realistic analytic formulations of what our acoustic radiation force sources look like. Um, I think by the time you hit the last day of a conference where there's been lots of discussion of shear waves, we don't really need to belabor what shear waves are. Um, the clinical problem that we're really um, formulating this in is in the context of liver elasticity imaging. Um, this is showing the sort of shear wave behavior that we see um, in in vivo data acquisitions here where the green are these propagating shear waves from an excitation on the left edge of this yellow box. And typically we can look at our propagating shear wave data as a function of position. So looking across this box, lateral position here and time, and we see a trajectory of this shear wave propagation. And a lot of work has been dedicated to looking at how we can correlate increases in shear wave speed with fibrosis stage. And we're asking the question of how important is it to take into account viscous effects? Is viscosity something we can use for a diagnostic parameter? Is it a confounder that we need to control for? How can we at least accurately capture information about viscous characteristics in this propagation? Okay. We are definitely not the first people to do this, so don't take the uh, approaches that I'm showing in the next few slides as anything novel that we've been um, spearheading on our own. Uh, there's actually been a lot of work done by the group at the Mayo Clinic on this. Um, across the community, there it has been some consensus on the approach to looking at this. So again, looking at that propagating shear wave run through space and time, what we could do is start to look at the spectral content of that propagating shear wave by taking the 2D Fourier transform. So we're moving this over into a case-based domain where we have spatial frequency and temporal frequency. Now looking at the characteristics of this, we know that we have windowed data both in space and time, so we expect to see some ringing in the frequency space, which you can kind of see as this banding. But overall what we're trying to do is characterize what are the characteristics of this cloud of energy distribution and how do they inform us about the material properties? So what we could do is if we look at a given discrete temporal frequency and look at the shape of that, so again, taking here a vertical projection at a given um, temporal frequency, in this case 200 hertz for this specific medium, what we can do is start to figure out how we can calculate phase velocities at a discrete frequency by looking at where the peak energy is, and we can make estimates of what the attenuation is as a function of the full width half maximum of this distribution. And again, this is detailed in work that's been published by other groups. Okay, I want to highlight specifically two cases of propagating shear wave fronts that we can use as starting points for this. Um, the most simple analytic form that we could do is look at the case of an attenuated plane wave. So let's make believe our shear wave source isn't focused, isn't finite in spatial extent, and somehow we generate this idealistic plane wave. Mathematically, that's friendly, so we'll make all of these assumptions. Looking at the formulation of the displacement field, we can bring this into the 2D Fourier space, and we have a formulation here for what that'll look like. And we can derive then from this analytic function what we expect our phase velocities to be in terms of where the peak occurs and come up with expressions for our full width half maximum with some sort of scaling factor and relate that to the attenuation of our medium. Okay? We then know on second pass probably that the plane wave isn't the most ideal source function to use for these sorts of formulations. So we can move to the next, next most accurate but also analytically tractable case, which is to say, well, let's make it ha look like a cylindrical source. And let's impose that we're getting far enough away from where that actual source is that the cylindrical approximation is most accurate. And we can add effectively a geometric weighting term for the fact that now we have a given shape to that function. We can go through the same procedure then, bring it into the 2D Fourier space. And now we can again come up with the relations for what the phase velocity is, again in terms of the peak energy. And now we have a modulated weighting function based on the full width half maximum of this distribution to relate it to the attenuation. So again, this is all work that others have been already exploring in this space. Our motivation was to say, okay, we have two things in play here. The cylindrical source is probably a great approximation to use if we can get far away. But we know that in vivo, 
we sometimes have waves that attenuate very quickly. So we might want to actually start to reconstruct shear waves closer to our source, which might make us violate our cylindrical assumption. And we also know that typically our sources are asymmetric. So we have different lateral and elevation extents to our acoustic radiation force distributions that would also violate that cylindrical assumption, especially if we're moving closer to the source to do reconstructions. So what we wanted to do is expand upon some of the work in the community and come up with an exact analytic expression for the 2D Fourier transform description of shear wave motion in viscoelastic media and now come up with a hopefully more accurate but still analytic formulation for the source distribution. So we're going to look at it as something that's Gaussian in lateral and elevation extent, but that's allowed to be asymmetric laterally and in elevation, to hopefully be a closer match to what we get in our in vivo excitations. From this, what we can do is then come up with known truth values from our formulation for what phase velocity and attenuation should be as a function of frequency and compare it to the values that we get when we look at the 2D Fourier transform space. Okay, how do we do that? So we have the perfect combination of an 8 a.m. talk and math. So I'm gonna hopefully make this a little more exciting. We start with our basic wave equation. We have in here some sort of externally applied force, which is where we're going to substitute in our Gaussian formulation here. We're going to apply then an elasti elastic viscoelastic correspondence principle, which effectively just says that we can treat our viscoelastic material as an elastic material with certain parameters at every single discrete frequency in the formulation. So we're able to then build up here this wave equation, move it over into the frequency space, and now we have a formulation of the wave equation as a function of frequency for viscoelastic material. Next, what we need to do is come up with our analytic formulation for the source function. Again, we've chosen to use a Gaussian shape, and what you can see here is that we have the ability to modulate separately the extent laterally, which is what I'm denoting as the x dimension, and in elevation with the y dimension. We could again bring this into Fourier space since we want to look at this as a function of frequency. Since we know that in our experimental setup we're only looking at shear wave propagation in one dimension, we take the solution and look at it purely in the x-axis, which is going to be our lateral dimension. And then we know even further we constrain the problem because we typically look at shear wave propagation just in one direction of that one axis. So we're further constraining the solution down to just look at the shear wave propagation in the positive x dimension. Okay. So now what we have with our analytic solutions is we can formulate for given parameters of a viscoelastic material. We have known um, shear moduli as a function of frequency where we know the real and imaginary components. We can derive from that the true um, phase velocities as a function of frequency and the true attenuations as a function of frequency. What we then want to do is take these truths and compare them with the phase velocities and attenuations that we would estimate after doing 2D Fourier transforms of the particle velocity field. So of those propagating fields in that positive x dimension, when we take the 2D Fourier transform and we estimate from them peaks for phase velocities and attenuations based off of weighted full width half maximums, how do they compare to these true values? What this um, series of plots is showing here is now the um, sigmas here are showing my spatial weights for my Gaussian excitations. So in this case, an axisymmetric excitation, something that should be closest to the cylindrical source, and then a 2 to 1 and 4 to 1 aspect ratio of Gaussian weighting spatially. What I'm showing here in this top row of plots is what the true phase velocity should be for our given material formulation in red. And then looking at the 2D derived, 2D Fourier transform derived phase velocity, you can see in white that there's going to be some degree of bias that evolves as a function of increasing frequency. And that bias can change as a function of the degree of asymmetry. I'm doing the same thing here then in this row, looking at the attenuation as a function of frequency, both from the analytic expression, which should be ground truth in red, and that that we derive from the full width half maximum of the 2D Fourier transform. So we're starting to get a feeling for how much bias we're seeing when we're looking at a plane wave assumption, applying it to the 2D Fourier transform, and comparing that to true. 
Like I mentioned on the earlier slides, we can get a little bit more accurate by instead of saying that it's a plane wave, we could say it's a cylindrical source. So what we're introducing again is that geometric term of one over square root of x uh, to modulate our Fourier transform space and how we bring that back to phase velocity. Again, this is going to be working under the assumption that we're far away from the source, but we're applying it to spatial positions that are closer than this assumption would be valid for. Applying the same exact procedure now for the same aspect ratios of the Gaussian source, I again have the same red values of truth for both phase velocity as a function of frequency and attenuation. I have in white, again, the originally plane wave assumed derived 2D Fourier transform solutions. And now what I've added there in cyan is how the square root of x factor for making it a cylindrical source improves the degree of bias that you see. So you can see a reduction in bias in the phase velocity terms and a reduction in bias, actually pretty appreciable reduction in bias for what you would get as the attenuation terms. So this is consistent again with what others have reported in the literature. We've just applied it with a formulation of the known ground truth here to evaluate the biases. Finally, what we wanted to ask is, OK, well, we know we don't have a cylindrical source. We know we don't have a plane wave source. And what we wanted to figure out is instead of having a fixed square root of x dependence to weight the geometric spread of the cylindrical source, what happens if we, we replace that power of x to the 1 half and allow that power to actually float and try to actually fit to it an ideal power that would more um, capture the behaviors of the asymmetric Gaussian and allow us to actually find a point of minimum in the bias that we would achieve. So again, in the plane wave case, we'd have a power of x to the 0. The cylindrical case, we have a power to a half. What happens now if we allow that power to be something that we optimize to minimum the bias? So looking again at those three excitation configurations, axisymmetric Gaussian, 2 to 1 and 4 to 1 Gaussians, what we did is we looked at varying the va value of p from 0 to 0.7 and look for the minima. As expected in the axisymmetric case, something extremely close to 0.5 is appropriate because it's going to be closest to that approximation. When we get a greater degree of aspect ratio, you could see that the point of the minima actually shifts to a lower power of p. And if we look at a greater range of aspect ratios of our Gaussian, we can see that the optimum power to geometrically weight the source by decreases as a function of the asymmetry. Overall, Looking at when we do this for a variety of aspect ratios, if we apply just plane wave assumptions, we have the most bias. Looking at our cylindrical wave assumption, we greatly improve that. And if we empirically are able to optimize that P numerically, we could do a little bit better. So in conclusion, we formulated a 2D uh, Fourier description now using spatially asymmetric Gaussian sources and applied those to viscoelastic media. Compared how well we can improve the bias from ground truth, phase velocity, and attenuation compared to both the plane wave and the cylindrical wave fronts. Right now, we've, we're working with this under the context of doing this as an optimization problem for no geometries. These could be the sorts of solutions we'd have for known in vivo configurations that we could apply a priori for a given then clinical situation. I'd like to thank our funding sources. And if we have time, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.